Okay, good morning, Real Life Church. Stuart Crane here. Great to see you all. We are going to be going back into our sermon series on the life of Elijah. Uh, so if you've got a Bible, grab that. Go to 2 Kings chapter 1. We're going to get there in just a moment. Quick reminder that we're going through the well-being journey um, as a church. But we're doing with our life groups. We've got the book. We've got the videos. Um, we are finishing, I think, this morning uh, financial well-being, and then next week is vocational well-being, and then that will be the end of the course. I'm aware that certain um, life groups are in different stages, but we are kind of coming to the end. So keep going with that. Lots of good stuff helping us process what's happened over the last 18 months. Um, and look at just our general well-being in life as we move forward in God with this. So. Back to uh, Elijah, if you've got your Bibles, we'll be reading uh, from 2 Kings chapter 1 uh, in a moment. We've been following the life of Elijah uh, from starting in 1 Kings 16. We're actually on our last two weeks. We've got this week, then we've got next Sunday, and then we're done, and then we're on to Christmas. And we're running alongside the well-being journey, particularly looking at uh, Elijah and what lessons we can learn from his life. If you've missed any of the stuff uh, so far, please just go online and catch up all the... Um, uh, the sermons are there, you can get that. Um, last week uh, we looked at 1 Kings chapter 21 uh, with Elijah and Naboth and what happened there with King Ahab. 1 Kings 22 we're going to skip over. The reason we're going to do that is because Elijah is actually not featured in that chapter so we're going to leave that and that's why we're picking up at the uh, beginning of 2 Kings. But just a quick recap of what happened in chapter 22 just so you're aware of sort of the, the general story. Elijah leaves a narrative and it focuses on Ahab. We've seen a lot of King Ahab, the king of Israel. He was a bad king and evil king, did all sorts of horrific things, didn't follow the Lord, uh, pursued false gods of Baal. He was married to Jezebel, his wife, who was an evil conniving uh, woman and sought to destroy uh, the prophets of the Lord and bring in Baal worship throughout uh, Israel. And what we find in chapter two is that uh, Ahab is fighting uh, against Syria to the north, and he is joined by Jehoshaphat, who was the king of Judah, the southern kingdom, because Israel had split north and south. And we've been focusing on the north uh, with Elijah, but King Jehoshaphat comes into it. And the long and the short of it is Ahab is killed in battle. So he dies and he is out of the story. But we remember from what Elijah said at the end of chapter 21, that there is judgment coming to the house of Ahab. There will be a judgment after him. And the fact that Ahab has now died in battle, this judgment is now coming on his house. And we'll see it kind of worked out uh, today. And if you read forward through the following chapters of two kings. And then what we find after Ahab's death, right at the end of one kings, there is a contrast and there's a contrast between King Jehoshaphat, who is in Judah in the south, and he is described as a good king, does many positive things, um, and is a, an example. While the new king in the north, which is Ahab's son, King Ahaziah, he is contrasted, and this is what's written about him right at the end of um, uh, 1 Kings. It says this, it says, Ahaziah, the son of Ahab, began to reign over Israel in Samaria in the 17th year of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah. And he reigned just two years over Israel. He did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and walked in the way of his father and in the way of his mother and in the way of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin. He served Baal and worshipped him and provoked the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger in every way that his father had done. And so what do we learn here right at the end of 1 Kings? We, went, we learn that Ahaziah, king, uh, son of Ahab, is now the king. He is not a good king. He's a bad king. He's, he walks in the way of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, which is the guy who, who, was, who led the breakaway kingdom when uh, the north and south split. And he set up false um, uh, golden calves of worship in the north and the south of the kingdom and led Israel there. And then it says he walked in the ways of his father and he worshipped Baal, uh, but he also walked in the ways of his mother well, his mother, and she was an evil woman and worshipped Baal too. And so we've got Ahaziah is not a good king. He works in the same ways as Jeroboam, but also his mum and his dad. He is actually worse than his dad. And one kings has taken pains to point out how bad Ahab was. And now we've got another king who's even worse than his father. So that's what we're going to be getting in today. Two Kings chapter one. All right, big idea. It's those who refuse to humble themselves before the Lord will face judgment. Those who refuse to humble themselves before the Lord will face judgment. And so as we start into two kings, now two kings follow straight on from one kings. Originally it was actually one book. It was split because of length. So actually when we look at it, it's actually the book of kings 
but we've got an artificial break uh, in our Bibles between 1 Kings and 2 Kings. So actually, the narrative just follows straight on. So we're just going to carry straight on into 2 Kings and read what it says. But before I read the passage, a couple of things I want you just to keep an eye out as we work through it. Because we're going to go through it all today. And there's uh, three things. First one, I want you to keep an eye out for the contrast uh, versus the sin of pride and the virtue of humility. Now, pride is thinking highly of ourselves and uh, putting ourselves in the place of God, while um, humility is um, thinking rightly of ourselves before God. It's not thinking less of ourselves, but thinking of ourselves less. And God loves us. He hates pride. It's what led the, the, the devil to fall, and God has always been opposed to it, it says, but he loves the humble. He loves humility, and so that's going to come up in this passage. The second thing I want you to keep an eye out is the imagery of up and down. Uh, there's up and down language throughout the passage, um, and they have both a positive and negative meaning. Um, it, when it talks about things going up or being lifted up, this is up is the place of God, is where he's exalted, it's where he's high and lift it up. But it's also, on a negative side, it is uh, just used to describe the actions of sinful man who try and put himself in the place of God, which is above us. And so there's that imagery of up that you'll find in the passage. There's also the imagery of down. And down, on a positive point, is, um, talks about when God graciously comes down to us and visits us. Um, it also talks about when man humbles himself before the Lord. And so there's a positive, when men fall on their knees and fall on their face for God, they humble themselves before God. But also it's got a negative dimension, and that is when prideful and sinful man is brought down by God. And he is, he is he's exalted himself, but God brings him down in judgment. Um, and it also talks about down, also talks about the Lord himself coming down in judgment to or on man for the sin that they have committed. And so... Have, a keep, have an eye out for that. That imagery comes up. I think I counted about 17 in all, 17 kind of references throughout the passage. If you're really long, try and mark them in your Bible, see if you can see them too. And the last thing just to look out for is the number of opportunities given to King Ahaziah to humble himself throughout the passage. There are quite a few, um, and unfortunately he doesn't take them, but we'll see. So let's read the passage. Why, a few Kings chapter 1, verse 1. I'm just going to set the scene, first couple of verses. It says, Now, after the death of Ahab... Moab rebelled against Israel. Now Ahaziah fell through the lattice in his upper chamber in Samaria and lay sick. Okay, so Ahaziah is now king of Israel, uh, but he's got two difficulties that face him. The first one is that Moab is rebelling against Israel, another nation, and the second that he is injured because in a domestic accident he's fallen down through the lattice, through the kind of the ceiling, and hurt himself badly. And the rebellion of um, Moab is likely due to Ahaziah being a weak king and then being too injured to respond to it because if he's sort of out on his, on his injury bed, on his sick bed, he can't kind of respond as the king. And there's a, what, we've got, what the um, author is doing is kind of pointing a bit of history, repeating himself because the book of 1 Kings, if you go back to the beginning of 1 Kings, it actually begins with a sick king, King David. He is ill on his deathbed there. And Moab uh, was a nation that was conquered by David. And has and since David's day, Israel has ruled Moab. It was one of God's enemies, one of the enemies of Israel, and David conquered them. And now they're seeking to break free. And so we've got a sick king like David, and David ruled, was strong, mighty warrior. Uh, Ahab, sick, weak king, and Moab are now uh, rebelling from him. And if you read on from chapter 3 onwards, you find more out about that uh, rebellion of Moab. And so in summary, we have a weak and sick king ruling over a weak and sick king kingdom. Now as we go through the passage, the main bulk of the passage, I want to look at three questions and I want to uh, go through them. So first one is, how does Ahaziah respond to his suffering? The second one is, how does Ahaziah respond to the word of God? And the third one, how does the Lord respond to Ahaziah's actions? So we're going to take each one in turn as we go through the passage. So the first question, how does Ahaziah respond to his suffering? Uh, verses two to four. Okay, and it says this, it says, so he sent messengers telling them, go inquire of Baal-zebub, the god of Ekron, whether I shall recover from this sickness. And so what he's doing is he is sick in his bed. He's had this accident. He's obviously in a lot of pain. 
and he is the king. He's the leader of God's people and he is in a crisis situation and he's worried about his health and will he carry on? Will he recover? And so what should the king of God's people do? Well, they should cry out to God in prayer. They should, they should go to him and call to him. But what does Ahaziah do? He cries out to the false, false god Baal and we've seen Baal throughout the whole kind of story that we've been looking at in this series and we found that he is not the true God, he has no power, he has no power to save, yet King Ahaziah is still calling out to him. And the name Ahaziah of the king means the Lord possesses. Yet when he's in trouble, he cries out to Baal of Ekron. He has failed to learn the lessons that his father uh, had been shown um, when God had proved himself more powerful on Mount Carmel, uh, when he'd brought, sent fire from heaven and proved himself greater than Baal, um, and he just hasn't learned. And this name Baal Zebub, is actually a derogatory nickname. It means Lord of the Flies. Um, it's believed to be a corrupted version of Baal Zebal, which means Baal the Prince, but actually they've kind of taken it and turned it into something saying, no, he's nothing, he's just Lord of Flies. And so that's why the, um, the authors put it there, kind of in a moist way of mocking uh, Baal. And Baal, it says, is of the god of Ekron. Now, Ekron is a Philistine city, and the Philistines are the enemies of Israel. They've been opposed to Israel and they too were defeated by King David. They were subdued by King David and Israel has kind of dominated and ruled over them. But we find now we have a weak, sick king and Israel, the nation, is weak and he is going to their enemies to find consultation. He is going to Israel's enemies to find out what's going to happen to him. And the king wrongly believes that Baal Zebub is in charge of healing and whether he will recover and he is seeking aid, aid outside of Israel. And his ultimate hope is not in the Lord, the God of Israel, um, which it should be. And he feels like he hasn't learned anything from what happened uh, with his father. And so as we read on, verse 3. It says, but the angel of the Lord said to Elijah the Tishbite, so Elijah comes on the scene, he says, arise, go to meet the messengers of the king of Samaria and say to them, it is because, is it because there is no God in Israel that you are going to inquire of Baal Zebub, the God of Ekron? Now, therefore, thus says the Lord, you shall not come down from the bed to which you have gone up, but you shall surely die. So Elijah went. Okay, so. Contrary to what the king believed, it's the Lord who is in, the Lord of God of Israel is in charge of all things, including life and death, which we've seen many times in the life of Elijah thus far. And so the Lord instructs Elijah to do two things. He says, you've got to go and bring a message to the king and remind him that actually I'm God. And the second thing you're going to do is you're going to tell him he's going to die from his injuries. So um, we've got a bit of deja vu from the life of Elijah. Again, he is going to front, confront a king for his failure to honour um, and be faithful to the Lord. And Elijah intercepts the messengers who are heading uh, to Ekron to go and consult Baal. And he comes in and says, actually, nope. There, he's, basing, he's basically asked this kind of rhetorical question, is there no God in Israel? And this actually comes up three times in the passage. Is, is, you know, is there no God here? And clearly in his life, he's demonstrated there is. And so he comes and he obeys instantly. He says he goes and grabs the messengers and says, actually, and he can deliver his messengers. Uh, and he says this in verse five, it says, the messengers returned to the king and he said to them, why have you returned? And they said to him, there came a man to meet us and said to us, go back to the king who sent you and say to him, thus says the Lord, is it because there is no God in Israel that you are sending to inquire of Baal Zebub, the God of Ekron? Therefore, you shall not come down from the bed to which you've gone up, but you shall surely, surely die. And he said to them, what kind of man was he who came to meet you and told you these things? They answered, he wore a garment of hair and a belt of leather about his waist. And he said, it is Elijah, the Tishbite. So the king's messengers return to the king and deliver the prophet's messengers, which is interesting because it shows where true authority lies. Because the king has sent his messenger and said, you go, I'm the king, I'm going to send you to Ekron and you're going to consult Baal and find out what's going to happen to me. Along the way, these messengers meet one guy on his own, the prophet of the Lord, Elijah, and he says, no, I've got a message. You go back to the king and tell him. And the servants recognize who's got the greater authority. Is it the king or is it the prophet of the Lord? It's clearly the prophet of the Lord. And so they return without ever going to Ekron. They never made it. And they report back the um, prophet's message to the king. And the prophet's message is not a good message. You're actually going to die. 
And the king then inquires, who's one sending this message? And he instantly recognized from the description, it's Elijah, who was the enemy of his parents. He was the one always confronting them. And so he's just like, ah, oh, this is the one who's bringing the message. And so it leaves us with a question. How's Ahaziah going to respond? What's he going to do? Is he going to humble himself and ask for mercy? Is he going to repent of his sin? Or is he going to send out the guards? Let's find out verse 9. It says this, Then the king sent him a captain of 50 men with his 50. He went up to Elijah, who was sitting on the top of a hill, and said to him, O man of God, the king says, Come down. But Elijah answered the captain of 50, If I'm a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume you and your 50. Then the fire came down from heaven and consumed him and his 50. So rather than repenting, the king sends out his soldiers to try and capture Elijah. He thinks he can control and intimidate the prophet of the Lord. He thinks his earthly resources and authorities can control the God of the heavens who rules everything and is sovereign over all things. Uh, and this time Elijah doesn't run. Uh, he is on a hilltop like he was in chapter 18 at Mount Carmel and he calls down fire again, comes down just like on Mount Carmel and proves that he's the man of God by burning up and destroying the soldiers. And so what's the king going to do now? Is he going to realise, oh my goodness, God is with this man, I should, I should repent, I should humble myself. Verse 11, he sends out the cards again, it says, and the king sent to him another captain of 50 men with his 50 and he answered and said to him "O oh man of God this is the king's order come down quickly but Elijah answered them if I am a man of God let fire come down from heaven and consume you and your 50 then the fire of God came down from heaven and consumed him and his 50 so in the response to the death of 50 of his soldiers and their officer what does the king do he does the same again he doesn't repent he is stiff-necked and stubborn, and he sends out another 50. He, he thinks maybe there'll be a different result this time. Maybe, I don't know, the fire's all been used up in heaven. Who knows? But he says, I'm going to send out another 50. And the same thing happens. They are consumed by fire. So what does the king do in response to this? Well, of course, the king by now thinking, oh my goodness, I'm completely in the wrong here. This, the Lord, the God of heaven, he is, he is in charge, not Baal. He can send down fire, he's consumed my folders, I will repent, I will humble myself. No, he doesn't. Verse 13, it says, And again, the king sent the captain of a third 50 with his 50, and the third captain of the 50 went up and came and fell on his knees before Elijah and entreated him, O oh man of God, please let my life and the life of these 50 servants of yours be precious in your sight. Behold, fire came down from heaven and consumed the two former captains of 50 men with their 50s. But now let my life be precious in your sight. Then the angel of the Lord said to Elijah, go down with him. Do not be afraid of him. So he arose and went down with him to the king. OK, so this is crazy. The king sends another 50 troops with their officers. So we've got 100 Soldiers who've been consumed and their officers and the king says, I'll just send another 50. I mean, clearly human life has no value to him. And um, I read somewhere about the definition of insanity is doing the same thing again, expecting a different result. And that's what he's doing. He's just he's insane. It's like, I'll send another 50 and maybe the result will be different this time. Um, and what must it have been like for the poor captain? He's like, OK, you go with your 50. He says, yeah, but the last two captains with their 50 both got fried by fire and he's now going in trepidation and this third captain takes a different approach rather than trying to order Elijah to come with him he humbles himself and begs for his own life and the life of his men and here's the point he does what the king doesn't do he does what the king has not done he humbles himself before the prophet of the Lord he humbles himself before God and in response the captain um, uh, Elijah recognizes that and the, the Lord recognizes that and basically says actually you can go with him because the captain has recognized that Elijah has greater authority greater authority than the king and he can't be coerced he can't be 
bullied into a situation. You can't be intimidated. And the response, the humble response of the captain um, is um, uh, kind of touches the heart of God. And the angel of the Lord says, Elijah, you go with him, you go to the king. God is drawn to humility and this captain demonstrates it. Which comes to the third question we're going to ask, which is how does the Lord respond to the king's pride? How does the Lord respond to the king's pride? Last couple uh, of verses of this passage, um, it says this, um, where was it? Um, shh, I've lost my place. Actually, in verse 16, it says to him, Thus says the Lord, because you have sent messengers to inquire of Baal-zebub, the god of Ekron, it is because there is no god in Israel to inquire of his word. Therefore you shall not come down from the bed to which you've gone up, but you shall shortly die. So he died, according to the word of the Lord that Elijah had spoken. Jehoram became king in his place in the second year of Jehoram, the son of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, because Ahaziah had no son. Now the rest of the acts of, of Ahaziah that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the king of Israel? So, once Elijah is before the king, he delivers the message that the Lord um, has given to him and that he is, he is going to die um, of his, um, because, his reason because of his idolatry, because of his pride, um, he did just as his father did before them. He refused to humble himself. He refused to repent. Um, and so he faces judgment because he refuses to acknowledge that the Lord is God of Israel. He dies on his deathbed. He doesn't recover. His reign is a mere two years long. And as a result, um, his brother, Jehoram, um, reigns in his place. He has no son. And so even his line doesn't continue. Actually, his brother has to come in and step him there. And the two names there in the they're different. They've got different. Um, the king of Judah and the king of um, Israel just have the same name, which can be a bit confusing. But that's the end of King Isaiah. He comes in briefly, a short chapter there, and but he fails to acknowledge who the Lord is. His pride uh, means he doesn't repent. He doesn't humble himself, and thus he faces the judgment of God and dies from his wounds. And so we see, kind of to sum up, we've seen that the Lord has judged Ahab for his sins and he has died. The Lord has judged Ahaziah for his sin and he has died. The only person actually from the kind of group that hasn't been judged is the wife Jezebel, who is absent from this story. Um, but Elijah prophesied back in um, 1 Kings 21 because of the murder of Naboth and her involvement in it. it kind of, he said that actually she would die and the dogs would eat her bones within the walls of the city of Jezreel, uh, where it was. And if you skip forward to 2 Kings chapter 9, verses 30 to 37, you actually see these words coming true. So uh, Jezebel doesn't escape the judgment of God. It's not dealt with particularly in our passages, but it's coming. And she is thrown out the window of a high tower um, to the point where her body is smashed on the floor and blood goes everywhere. It's pretty grim and graphic um, and the dogs come and eat the body and chew the bones and when the body has come to be buried there's not enough really of the body to bury uh, which is just fulfills the prophecy of Elijah and so what we find in this situation is the word of God is spoken and it comes to pass and those who do not humble themselves those who do not repent those who do not acknowledge God as who he is face his judgment and his wrath um, as a result all right three things uh, let's do a little bit of application uh, work for us now and see how we can earth this. Um, and I've got a couple of questions and then something hopefully to encourage us at the end. And the first one is, where are you looking for direction and help? Where are you looking for direction and help? Where do you go when life is tough and things are getting on top of you? Where do you go when those big, uh, difficult life events kind of come in whether they've come from your own actions or kind of externally and they kind of make life stop and screech your hold or go off into a different direction how do you respond where do you go for direction where do you go for help where do you go for meaning and understanding where do you go to find peace and purpose in those really difficult situations because in our story we had King Ahaziah and he faced one of those. He had rebellion in his kingdom. He was personally injured. And so he had uh, problems uh, in terms of his health. And so we had kind of external things. He had internal issues. And we find immediately he responds by going to uh, consult the false god 
of a foreign nation. He immediately goes and runs to Baalzebub of Ekron, and that's where he's gone. He goes, and uh, we're no different now. We might look differently, but in times of crisis, in times of difficulty, we run to places to try and find meaning, understanding, direction, purpose, peace in what's going on. And in the 21st century West, we have so many different ways we can go. We can look to political leaders and their ideologies. You know, actually, if we follow that, we get involved in that, things will be okay. If we go after celebrities and their endorsements, things will get better in our life. We go to self-help gurus and their books and blogs and advice we have. We go to fortune tellers and psychics. We go to social media influences, lifestyle coaches and their fitness and diet plans. We go to the latest, current, loudest social cause that is kind of being bled across the airways. We have a myriad of false religions and cults that you can get involved in. We have hobbies and social groups that we can go to and find kind of help and meaning and purpose as well as trying to just dull the pain by gorging on food and alcohol and sex and possessions and all those things. And of those lists, some of them are good, some of them are bad, but none of them are ultimate. None of them will save. They all lack the saving power to give uh, purpose and meaning and deliverance from your situation. We wrongly believe that some of these things will save us and deliver us from the trials of life and the pressures we face. And the reality is only the Lord God of Israel revealed to us in Jesus Christ can do that. Only he can fully save us. Only he can deliver us from what we face in this world. Only he can carry us through death into the next life with him. And in your, in your um, life, you may have a whole host of things going on. And you might have practical issues that can be helped with uh, kind of uh, medicine and the healthcare, or you might have money issues that can be helped with sort of debt advice or relationships that can have some counseling and wisdom put in there. But the question is, what is your faith ultimately in? What is your purpose ultimately in? What have you put your hope and trust in? Because some of those things aren't bad, they're just not ultimate. And the, result, the reality is we are to humble ourselves before God and to cry to him for mercy. We are to humble ourselves before God and cry to him for mercy. And King Ahaziah is an example of someone who refused to do that again and again, despite being given an opportunity, despite being given another chance, despite being given, a, okay, you can do it now. There's an opportunity to change your way, to change your attitude. And so the question is, where do you go for your help? Where do you go for your meaning in life? And I've got a couple of um, diagnostic questions you might want to ask yourself, which kind of reveal some things of your heart. When troubles come, when difficulties come, and we've had, you know, 18 months of various kinds of those uh, for us in this nation, and the questions are, when trouble comes, what do you run to and what do you withdraw from? What do you run to and what do you withdraw from? Because... The answer to those two questions will reveal loads about your heart and your attitude and what is ultimate and important in your life. In the day of trouble, where do you run to and what do you run from? And in my experience, pastoral ministry have been 19 years, I think in April, just leading God's people in my own life. In the day of trouble, there are two types of people. There are those who run to God and his people and there are those who withdraw from God. And his people. And I recognize when trouble comes, it can be tough, it can be painful, it can be hard, it's overwhelming. But the people of God, those who recognize God as their ultimate, recognize God as their Lord and Savior, put their faith and trust in Him, run to God and His people in times of trouble. Run to God and His people in times of trouble. Those who don't recognize God as ultimate, don't recognize, they withdraw from God and His people. At these times they go to other things and there's a question there where is your faith where is your trust where are you running to in times of difficulty in times of pain second question how are you responding to the word of god how are you responding to the word of god because king ahaziah heard the word of god it was coming to him and he responded with pride and arrogance and rejection and suffered for it and the question is for us how do we respond to the word of God? We have the word of God. 
um, as Jesus revealed to us in our Bible. Jesus is the Word of God, but he is revealed to us in the Word of God, which is our Bibles. And my question is, how are you responding to that? How are you responding to that? If you're not a believer listening to this, I just want to tell you that Jesus is God the Son. He is holy and loving and just and kind, and he is the Lord and Saviour of all things. He is the ruler and reigner. He is sovereign God over everything. And he tells us to repent, to turn away from living our own life, from putting our own trust in ourselves, from doing our own things, our own ways and refusing to listen. And he says, leave your sin, which are the offences that we cause against the Holy God, things we do uh, that we shouldn't do and things that we don't do that we should do. And these are our attitudes as well as our thoughts um, as, uh, and actions. And we are to put our faith and trust in Jesus. Jesus lived the perfect life. He died a death on a cross. He took uh, the punishment for our sins that we deserved. He rose victorious from the grave. He ascended into heaven and he sent his Holy Spirit to be with us now on earth. And that was a great act of humility on his part. But now he's exalted, lifted up to the highest place. And the reality is judgment is coming. Jesus said he will bring judgment, but he is giving us time to repent. Time like ASI got, time after time, what are you going to do? And he didn't. And God, Jesus is saying to us, I paid the price for you. Are you going to come and know me? If you are a Christian here, I just want to ask you, are you reading or listening to your word of God? Are you doing what it says? Because the word of God in our Bibles revealed to us, reveals about Jesus Christ. This, when we look at this, we often look down on it, we read it down. We look down at it and we, we kind of bring our judgments and our, our thoughts to it and what we think it says. But the reality is the, the word of God sits above us. The word of God is above us. It, we don't judge it, it judges us. We don't come to it uh, and tell it what to think. We, it tells us. And we as Christians need to honour the word of God, be reading the word of God, be listening to the word of God. We are to humble ourselves under it and we are to live the life the way it tells us to. We are to repent, to turn away from the things that we do that offend God to recognize them, to acknowledge them before him and say, God, forgive me for that. I turn away. I'm going to live differently and go a different direction, empowered by God's spirit. We are to be obedient to what it says to us. In First, we need to read it to understand it. And then what we learn from that, we are to be obedient. What about areas? Are you baptized as a believer? Have you repented of your sins? Are you part of a local church? Are you giving financially? Are you serving? Are you forgiving those who've wounded you? Are you seeking to live in harmony and community? Are you declaring the good news of God to those around you? We are to listen to God's word. And so there's a question for us today is how are you responding to God's word? Are you even getting into it? And if you are, are you doing what it says? Last thing, last thing. Jesus is a better Elijah. We always want to end with Jesus in our study of Elijah. Jesus came not as a prophet, but actually as God's prophet. He was the prophet. He came as God. He came as the word of God. And he came as the prophet of God to declare God's word to the people um, of the world. He came to deliver a message, not just to a king, but to all mankind. And it was a message uh, for those who humble themselves, um, there is a relationship available, a relationship full of hope and forgiveness and life in all its fullness in this world uh, and the next. Jesus came down and humbled himself as a way to make this happen by dying in our place and then rising again and taking the judgment we deserve. He is the one who now stands and makes his offer to us. Come, humble yourself. Give up trying to be in charge. Recognize that you're not in charge, that he is God. He is Lord. He is Savior. He loves you with a never-ending love and he wants to know you and have relationships with you. And so kind of the message here is just I finish is come to him. Come to him. Come to him. Come to him um, in worship. Come to him in repentance. Come to him in faith. Come to him as you study the word and you learn about it there. If you're not a Christian, listen to this. Repent of your sins. Put your faith and trust in him. If you are, enjoy the fact that you know him and seek to build that relationship. Listen to him. Grow through that. Um, and I think that will end there. We'll end there. I'm just going to pray and then we're going to finish. Um, Lord Jesus, we thank you for who you are, Lord. We thank you that you came to earth. We thank you that you are the word of God and you proclaim the word of God and that is revealed to us in the word of God, the Bible. Lord Jesus, we want to say today we humble ourselves before you. We look to you. We recognize 
that you are God, that you are Lord. And we cry out to you for mercy, God, we pray, say you equip us. We say you stir us to study your word, to live the life you've called us to, uh, that we may honour you and follow you. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. That's the end. Love you guys. Um, hope to see you soon.